Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending Improving's August 5th Virtual Lunch and Learn. Before we start, I want to inform you about a feature in the presentation that will make the session more interactive. Please make note of the question mark icon at the upper right of the presentation screen. Clicking that icon will open the question and answer feature, which allows you to send the moderator questions to be delivered to our insightful presenter at the appropriate time. Speaking of insightful presenters, I am proud to present Jim Bethencourt, who is a software developer at Improving. Today, Jim will be sharing a webinar titled Getting Started with Cucumber. Jim, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Sherman. Hi, as Sherman said, my name is Jim Bethencourt. I've been developing software for about 15 years, uh, and uh, I lead the Houston Java Users Group. Uh, you can check that website out, uh, our website out at www.hjug.org. I do want to warn you, though, that uh, we are in the process of updating it, um, but we do have meetings monthly, typically on the last Wednesday of every month. Uh, I'm very excited to join Improving, and it's just been wonderful. The culture, the people have all been absolutely amazing. If you'd like to reach out to me, talk to me, or follow what I do, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, and I'm also on GitHub. Uh, I'd like to also mention the Improving Improving's virtual lunch and learn talks. Uh, you can find them at improving.com slash virtual dash events. And you can also find past talks and other talks that uh, that Improving has, has posted by going to YouTube uh, at YouTube slash user slash Improving Enterprises slash videos. And that's also where this talk will be posted after, after we're done. So if you want to go back and find something that you missed, uh, you'll find it here. So I'd like to start this presentation out with a very bold statement. Cucumber is not a testing tool. It's actually a collaboration tool that, when used properly, creates living documentation that's also an executable specification. So let's start out with a few questions. Let's break it down. So what is the goal of a sprint? You said to produce a potentially shippable product increment, you would be correct. Well, that leads us to the next question. What comprises a potentially shippable product increment? How about a minimally marketable feature? So is it turtles all the way down? No, thankfully we have, uh, we have a, a special meeting that happens regularly that a team uses to make up to determine what goes into a minimally marketable feature. This meeting or these meetings that actually happen several times a day are called a three amigos meeting. So the Three Amigos meeting consists of a business analyst, a developer, and a tester. It actually sounds like the start of a funny joke, but it's true. They collaborate and share their unique perspectives as they discuss what should and shouldn't be part of a feature. The goal of delivering minimally marketable features uh, uh, is to validate our assumptions as soon as possible in case they turn out to be wrong and we need to change directions. So when, you come, when you're working on coming up with minimally marketable features, ask, what is the value or the impact of this feature? Why is it worth doing? What benefits will, who will benefit from this feature and how? What makes this feature big? Uh, do we need to slice it up? Do we, are there, is there too much of something, not enough of something? Uh, what takes a long time, uh, even if it's well documented? And you should also ask, what are the risks involved? What are the irreversible negative consequences that could happen? Write these as statements of risks as being as if the risk were being realized. For example, we're not able to optimize performance enough for the reports to run overnight. Don't just say performance, be specific. And also ask in these meetings, what are the uncertainties? What important questions do we need to answer in order for this feature to succeed? So let's get started. First thing you should do is consider, ask yourself, what are the less critical features and what are the happy paths that we can tackle? So when you start with less critical features, it'll take some of the pressure off of getting things exactly right. Coming up with happy paths will help to get things started quickly. It's also important to use personas and concrete examples. When you use personas, this will give everyone involved a better understanding of who the users are. There's a wealth of documentation on personas and 
uh, what co goes into them. And I strongly encourage you to, to look up, look up and, and learn about personas. In agile teams, these are invaluable. Using concrete examples will help make sure that the team understands what the user is trying to accomplish. When personas and uh, concrete examples are used, it allows everyone involved to understand the struggles of their users much better and helps everyone to stay grounded in the reality of the user. Using specific ubiquitous language is the, that is the language of the business will allow any user who reads this feature file to understand what the feature is trying to accomplish. Avoiding technical language makes, these, makes it much more approachable. So what you really want to do is make sure that this feature file can be read by anyone, not just a developer, not just a specialist, but anyone who joins the team. So what you end up with is living, a living document that will continue to grow and tell us when something has gone wrong, typically through a unit test failure, or typically through a failure of one of the, one of the, one of the tests, rather. The need for test scripts and requirement documents will be significantly reduced. You also want to make sure that you use a technical, avoid technical language that is tied to the developer's domain or, uh, or is our jargon, things along those lines that are either tied to the business domain jargon or to the uh, technical domain jargon. And again, this results in living documentation that anybody can sit down and quickly understand what the feature is trying to accomplish. So what is a feature file? A feature file is an executable specification, specification written in plain language. The Cucumber engine can understand 40 different written languages. Using keywords, the Cucumber engine can execute code that matches these phrases. Effectively, it's what's called a pigeon language that allows for the, uh, a, an interface between the programming language and the, the, the language that we speak. So at the top of the feature file is the feature keyword and the feature name and a description about the scenarios that are about to follow. In this case, this feature is called, is it Friday yet? Because well, everyone wants to know when it's Friday. The feature keyword must be followed by a background scenario or a scenario outline keyword. So a scenario is a single concrete example of how the system should behave in a particular situation. And it's composed of statements called steps. We use the given word, uh, the word, the keyword given to set up the context where the scenario happens. The when keyword to interact with the system somehow. And the then keyword to check that the outcome of the interaction was what we expected. So as you can see here, the, uh, given that today is Thursday, when I ask whether it's Friday yet, then I should be told nope. And there's, there are no technical instructions and there's no jargon. So each scenario must be able to make sense and to be executed independently of any other scenario. It should also contribute meaningful business value. For example, a login screen doesn't contribute business value and it, because it should just work and it shouldn't have a feature file with scenarios in it. Keep implementation details like clicking on buttons, selecting drop downs, and, and uh, things along those lines out of the scenario steps. Focus on the business language. Implementation details belong in the step definition code. Avoid excess detail and do your best to use declarative rather than instructional language. So there are five different discrete uh, step return values. And so when it runs, it'll return with either undefined, which is when Cucumber can't find a step definition that matches a step, and it marks that step as undefined and it stops the scenario. You have a pending return value, which happens when Cucumber finds a step definition that's halfway through being implemented, and it marks the step as pending and stops the scenario. You tell Cucumber that the step is pending by throwing a pending exception. Skipped. A step is skipped when another step that executes before the skipped one is pending or undefined. And then failed is it will happen if the block of code that's executed by a step definition raises an exception. Cucumber will mark that step as failed and stop the scenario. The rest of the steps in the scenario will be skipped. And last but not least, pass. Hey, it worked. So these, this is the list of supported programming languages. Uh, as you can see, we have quite a number, um, almost, uh, gosh, was it tw oh, well over 20. Um, 
Some are officially supported, which they are uh, official implementations that are hosted by Cucumber uh, and the Cucumber team, uh, cucumber.io. Uh, Semi-official implementations are hosted elsewhere. These are the ones with the blue, with the blue sort of, 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 of lozenges. And they are, um, they are hosted elsewhere, but they use components from Cucumber. There are also unofficial languages, which are here in the black, such as Rust, Go, and Unencumbered, which are hosted elsewhere and don't use any components from Cucumber. And then finally, you have unmaintained implementations, which are the have the, these red lozenges. And they are, uh, they are official, but they're unmaintained, and they need new maintainers. Uh, these were previously uh, implementations that were hosted by, by the folks at Cucumber.io, but they, they found that these were not being used uh, broadly enough to warrant uh, further maintenance. So now it's time for a demo. So I'll be drawing um, uh, this uh, this code I've written. I based it on Cucumber's uh, uh, 10 minute uh, tutorial demo. Uh, you're welcome to look at it there. But uh, if you want to look exactly at the code that I've written, uh, this is uh, Git on GitHub, my GitHub uh, uh, page at hello cucumber i want dot ice dash ice cream. So uh, this is using Java and Spring Boot. Um, you don't need to use a DI container or a dependency injection container when you use Cucumber. Uh, however, when you use Cucumber without one of these DI integra integrations, it manages the creation of all of your hooks and step definitions itself. Cucumber creates uh, fresh instances of each step definition or hook class for each individual scenario. That means that each class needs to have, that these classes need to have a default constructor. Otherwise, Cucumber won't know how to create them. This makes it hard to share state safely between several step definitions. If static variables are used to share state across scenarios, it can lead to pro problematic tests that fail intermittently. So, okay, um, let me open up IntelliJ. So as you'll see here, I have uh, the feature file. Uh, is it Friday yet? And everybody wants to know when it's Friday. And what I can do, I can actually take and run an individual uh, an individual test here. Um, uh, first, let me take a step back. This is again a, a simple Spring Boot application, um, and I want to know if it's Friday. And so this this method is called by the step scenario by the Cucumber steps. And this is the actual test runner, the harness that will run our Cucumber tests for us. Uh, as you can see, this um, uh, this does this doesn't have much in it, and then the feature file right here is where we define our feature and our scenarios. And I'll go into the background and scenario outline in a minute. And as you can see here, we also have our step definition file, which will be uh, which will be called by our, um, our 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 scenarios. So I commented these out actually because Cucumber provides a really nice feature. Uh, it will actually take and tell us what code we need to write for our scenarios. So uh, I'll go ahead and run just one test, and we can watch it fail and give us an unde give us undefined error messages. So okay, um, see here. Okay, so if we scroll down here, actually tell us um, create a glue annotated glue class with some context configuration. Here it actually knows that we want to use Spring Boot, and it tells us what to what, what to what to annotate it with, and then it gives us the undefined steps and the actual code that we can use to get started. So we have the given and the when and the then that we annotate uh, the methods with, and then and we can also um, uh, it also creates a pending exception for us that will be thrown. Uh, so that way, the steps will no longer be undefined, and we know that they're pending and they're in the process of being written. So now, if I go back and I uncomment uh, the step definitions, then I then we can see these tests pass, and um, then I'll cover the rest of the code here in just a minute. So, all right. So now uh, you'll see here that it should be easier to see. Um, I have the given today is Thursday, right here in this annotated given uh, annotation. 
and then it maps to setting today to today to Thursday. And uh, same thing with today is Friday. And then for the when, uh, I asked whether it's Friday yet, uh, it, this will map to the when step. And then the then step is, well, I should be told uh, if today is Friday or not. And as you can see here, I'm using an assert equals, which is using a calls out to JUnit 4. Uh, there are, uh, Cucumber is, is also JUnit 5 capable now. Um, so you can use JUnit 5 uh, if you would rather. I think they also support test in G. Uh, I haven't looked into that myself, but uh, it, the, the best way, the best place to look for this is actually in the Cucumber repository itself. They have a number of examples and it's, it's really wonderful just how much they've done. Um, and uh, so uh, let's go ahead and run this and we can see it passed. Okay, there we go. All right, starts up spring, starts a context and we see that it's passed. So all three steps have passed, especially and particularly the I should be told nope step, which is our uh, arrange, which, are, which is our assert step in our arrange act assert uh, trio. And um, so then we can also run the entire feature if we want to. And it'll run all of the unit tests that are all of the, all the steps. And since, um, as you can see here, uh, Thursday isn't Friday and we are told, nope, that it is not, it is indeed not Friday yet. And when it is Friday, we can be told that TGIF. So um, uh, you're probably wondering, how do I organize my feature files? Uh, a number of places I've looked strongly suggest one feature file per domain entity. Uh, and then also one step def definition file or class per domain entity. Uh, and it's important to realize that uh, if you define a phrase, it, will, it can be used globally because step definitions are actually global. Uh, this is important to keep in mind because if you use the same phrase across multiple feature files, you're gonna start having problems especially if you have the same phrase in a given used in a win or a win phrase used in a given. Uh, so again, use very specific language that is uh, because step definitions are global. So now you're probably wondering, well, how do I scale? Because you might have typically maybe 15, 20, maybe more features, maybe more scenarios in a single feature file. Um, most folks recommend not going beyond 20 or maybe 25 or 30, but you again, you want to ha allow the user to, to, to realize and understand quickly what the feature is trying to accomplish. So first, let's start out with a background section. Um, so we have the feature and then we have a background. So a background section in a feature file allows you to specify a set of steps that are common to every single scenario in the file. Instead of having to repeat those steps over and over for each scenario, you move them up into a background element and then they fade into the background. There are, a couple, there are a couple of advantages to doing this. If you ever need to change those steps, you only change them in one single place. The importance of those steps fades into the background so that when you're reading each individual scenario, you can focus on what's unique and important about each scenario. So again, it's Thursday, uh, we have two different scenarios, but the background statement applies to both of them. So I'll go ahead and uncomment uh, these, uh, the background step here, and then also the ice cream, uh, I should have bowl, ice cream in my bowl, or I shouldn't have ice cream in my bowl because, well, I like to have, I don't know about you, but I like to have ice cream on Friday. So if I go ahead and I rerun uh, uh, this feature file, I should, we should see the, uh, uh, whether we have ice cream in our bowl or not. So it, here it's TGIF and I should have ice cream in my bowl. And, it, and then here I should not have ice cream in my bowl. Let me take a quick step actually and point out to you in the step definitions um, that it's quite nice that um, uh, you can have uh, variables that are mapped to uh, to different to brackets. So here I can take and uh, specify uh, variables basically. So um, I'll get to this more in a minute, but uh, you, you see you can have plain English language. And if here I'm looking for a string 
And I, the, what's passed in in the feature and the step definition is passed in to this method and then used inside of this method for the step definition. So uh, next, I'd like to talk about um, uh, scenario outlines. So reading the same examples over and over again that have slight variations can get really exhausting. So thankfully, we have scenario outlines that can help make multiple scenarios much easier to read. Now, I want to make sure that you understand, don't go crazy unless every scenario, because a really long table is also really hard to read. And it's better to make your own examples illustrative or representative rather than exhaustive. So also of particular note is the fact that every scenario that you list will be executed. So it's like this. So if you have a table with 20 different examples, this scenario will be executed 20 different times. You should, ask, you should ask yourself, do I really need all 20 of those examples or maybe just a few? So here I'll go ahead and, uh, and uncomment the scenario uh, that I've created here. And um, uh, we can go ahead and execute it as well. And uh, you'll see here what we have is the, um, uh, the variable placeholder for each of these scenarios, and then the table where the scenario where, where you are where you're injecting each of the values. So in this case, day uh, maps to the day column, and uh, the answer maps the answer column. So uh, what Cucumber will do, it'll take and for the first scenario, it'll inject Friday where where day is and TGIF to where answer is, and then so on and so forth for Sunday and anything else. So now if we run this example again, we should see a total of six, seven, five, five scenarios run. So here we have um, uh, Thursday, Friday, and not Friday. Um, so let me try this one more time. OK, there we go. So OK. So we have, okay, so here are the examples. You can see uh, here's our scenario and here are the examples. And it breaks it down for us and shows us what exactly is populated for each different scenario. Okay, um, so what about unit tests? Unit tests are still important. BDD tests, uh, you wanna use BDD tests to make sure you're building what the customer wants and what, uh, and what to do in genuinely exceptional business conditions that the user might encounter. Definitely continue to use unit tests, to test things that should just work and contribute, but don't contribute business value, such as login screens. So do you need a report? There's a great Cucumber report uh, for, that's in, for Java projects called Cluecumber. You heard that right, Cluecumber with an L. It's on GitHub. And there's, there are instructions on how to use it. And I've also uh, made it enabled to, to, uh, to run on, I've enabled it, set it up to run on the Cucumber uh, example that I have on GitHub repository that I've created. It requires, requir requires minimal changes to your project, uh, primarily changing your uh, POM and then adding a simple uh, uh, annotation value to the, uh, your Cucumber test runner, this JSON target Cucumber report, Cucumber JSON. And then if we go and look in the target, it will actually take and uh, uh, let me actually go ahead and run this in Maven and we will see it. Okay, Cucumber report. Sorry, um, let me run it here. Okay, generate a report, and then as you can see here, it creates a very nice, uh, very nice report for us that's very interactive, and we can drill into each of the different reports, and um, it's quite easy to use. And again, it requires very little modification to your source code, and then you can take and uh, add it as a plugin uh, to your to your build section right here. And that's about it for the Cucumber report. And then 
so you can also make sure that you don't miss a scenario by using mutation testing. Um, this is actually a plugin that I helped to migrate from Cucumber 4 to Cucumber 5. And um, it is a uh, drop-in plugin as well. Uh, it's called uh, the PyTest Cucumber plugin. Uh, it's a it's basically like a virtual fourth amigo, and it's Apache licensed. Um, however, it does not yet work with Cucumber six, um, and so you're probably wondering uh, what this report is. So if you go to pytest.org, um, it has a better explanation. Um, but so this uh, the the dark the dark green lines that you see, the dark green highlighted line you see here uh, is a line where all mutations were killed. Um, and and the, the light green are lines that were covered. And if you see uh, light pink, those are lines that were not covered. And if you see dark pink, those are lines where I mean, all of the mutations were not killed. So you're probably wondering, well, what exactly is a mutation? Well, I'm glad you asked. A mutation uh, in this case is a where the mutation engine uh, test mutation engine takes to modify the source code of the project and will then uh, take and uh, rerun all tests that call that particular line of code. There are a number of them. Uh, the most common ones, um, uh, so I guess again, full explanations of these are at pytest.org. The most common ones that are used are conditionals boundary, which uh, replaces less than with, with less than equals and less than equals with less than. And then the same for greater than or greater than equals. The increment and decrement operators uh, mutations swap the operations of increment and decrement. And then the math operators uh, replace the math operator with their opposite, oper opposite operator and it replaces the modulate the modulo operation mod with multiply. Math, math mutations also incorporate bit bitwise operators. Negative conditional uh, overlaps with conditional mutator, but it, it is certainly very useful in some cases. The return values mutator returns true instead of false. It returns zero instead of an integer, or one if it returns zero. It, it returns not a null, not a, not a number for zero, and it returns non-null values with null, and it returns a runtime exception if a method returns null. The void method call mutation allows us to determine uh, if the call can be if the call to the method is really needed, or if additional testing of the side effects produced uh, uh, by the call are actually required. It's also a stronger and all groups of mutations that perform additional mutations, with all performing every single mutation, but it takes a lot longer to run because there are, I think, about 130 different mutations. And again, I'd strongly encourage you to look at pytest.org. Uh, you don't need to use the Cucumber plugin for this. Uh, it's a great plugin all on its own, and uh, it's incredibly useful to help you find out both which, which code is not actually tested and which code are uh, not fully tested, rather, and also maybe which unit tests you don't need to run. So uh, here are a couple of books that I used uh, to help help me uh, learn about uh, this this. Uh, when, as I was learning about cucumbers, I was putting together this presentation. This first one called Behavior Driven Development with Cucumber uh, talks a lot about the Three Amigos meeting. It talks about um, the, uh, the process that teams will go through as they adopt Cucumber. And um, it, I found it to be very, very insightful. It, way, it goes way beyond the technical details. Uh, it does use Ruby as the, as the example language. Uh, and uh, But again, the concepts are universal applicable across uh, behavior-driven development. The other book that I used called the Cucumber for Java book uh, focuses more on the technical implementation details, but also discusses uh, the uh, the methods and the approach to, to take it all. Here they also talk about um, uh, tags, which are which can be very powerful, and they also talk about um, uh, the before and after steps that can be run as part of the step definition classes to help set up things such as databases, um, you take uh, Rest, uh, rest in points if you want to take and, and, and use your, your cucumber tests as, uh, 
as integration tests. However, I would strongly discourage that if at all possible, because again, you want to have these unit tests run fast, or these, these cucumber tests rather run fast, have them run as part of your as your uh, as part of your builds, so that way you can catch these errors early and often. So a few resources. Uh, again, I'd like to refer you to the the repository that I have, uh, where uh, I've created this. Uh, uh, that, I, that I showed you on a demo. You're absolutely more than welcome to, to look at it, figure, uh, look at it, see how it figure, see how it works out, and borrow it, copy the code. Um, feel free. Um, and then also, um, I, I'll work on migrating it to Cucumber Six along with the uh, the Cucumber PyTest plugin. Uh, Cucumber.io. Uh, this is the home for for the Cucumber for the Cucumber team for the Cucumber product. Um, it's open source, uh, though they though the team does have uh, several different uh, tools that can help make your life easier. Uh, they also have a lot of a lot of tutorials, and uh, they have a Cucumber podcast, which is a lot of fun to listen to. It's uh, hosted by the folks who actually maintain Cucumber. And also, uh, one person in particular that I'd like to point out is a fellow named John Ferguson Smart. He's uh, he's a, a thought leader and is working on the second edition of his BDD in Action book, and uh, it uh, it's actually um, it's on the Manning website. So if you look at if you look it up or do a search for BDD in action second edition, um, it's in uh, uh, open basically kind of an open beta. It's early access. Um, and so uh, if you have questions, if you want to ask him uh, to include something, uh, this now is a great opportunity to do so. And also, I'd like to thank John. Uh, he, he actually reviewed these slides for me. Uh, so again, if John, if you're watching, if you're listening, thank you very much. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to wish you happy cucumbering. Thank you very much. Uh, Shervin, are there any questions? Jim, we actually have a number of questions. Uh, the first one is just one for uh, clarification. The attendee asked, you use the acronym SO. Does that mean scenario outline when it's used for data-driven testing? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I can't remember what slide that was on, but more than likely, yes, that was a scenario outline that I was referring to. Yes, excellent question. Uh, the next one asks, what are the differences between JBehave and Cucumber? They're very similar. They share a lot of heritage and a lot of history. Uh, they're maintained by different teams. Um, I, I haven't worked with JBehave much, um, but they do implement and they do use Gherkin uh, as, as a shared language. Um, and so they, they work together, I imagine, on that. And you, you, if you wanted to, you could have, so you could start with the same feature file and you could, you could work with other of the libraries um, to have, actually take and implement your step, your, your step definition. I wish I could give you a better answer, but thank you for that question. And then Mike asks, is it feasible? Is it a feasible goal that QA and analyst roles can write Cucumber tests in addition to developers? Oh, yes, absolutely. That's a brilliant question. Um, the goal here is to take and have any member of the team sit down and write uh, scenarios that are part of the feature. Um, it's, this is not strictly a developer, a developer uh, job um, because what we want is we want everybody to have to take ownership of these features and to help build out these scenarios and in fact a lot of times the the, the step definitions are more glue code than they are uh, program programming logic uh, that that's deep in the bowels of the code and so I would strongly encourage uh, business analysts and testers to start uh, learning how to actually implement some of this code um, and, and and so you can actually everybody can can share share that that effort that's a fantastic question thank you so jim this was our last question but you're a popular guy and they're just literally pouring in so uh, okay the next fantastic. Question is, Keep coming. we have plenty of time <laughs> would you use cucumber with selenium uh sparingly very sparingly um so you you, you can, what you can do you can actually tag these steps uh, or these uh, these um, uh, step definition classes uh, with uh, with with uh, with annotations and I'm, uh, is, that, is that right? No, I'm sorry. You tag the feature files with uh, say at Selenium or whatever the step definition is that you whatever the the uh, the tag is that you want to define, and then you create a corresponding tag or an annotation in the step definition class, and then those and only those. Uh, 
uh, scenarios or feature files, for example, would be executed as part of a Selenium test. But again, you, if you've heard of the test pyramid, you want to have these as the sort of the, the very top test. You don't want to have all of your cucumber tests run as Selenium tests again because they tend to be very slow. And what you want is to have your cucumber test uh, validate the the business scenarios that you that your users have defined. And also frequently what, ha what will happen, you'll find that you'll drift toward using a, an instructional language in your, in, your, in your scenarios, which is not what you want uh, when you define Selenium tests. You can certainly do that though. And again, the Cucumber for Java book does a great job of illustrating how to use Selenium in your Cucumber tests, or rather your Cucumber scenarios, I should say, in de step definitions. And we have another one. Uh, give an example for a step definition using given function. Are you able to provide them one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's go ahead and go back here. Um, so um, we have a, uh, uh, is it Friday? So here we have the given and um, we, is it Friday? And so here we have, I have these at the top. We have um, uh, the, Given here, so we have a given. So given today is Thursday. So we have um, uh, a, a variable, a class variable that is that is that's uh, that's passed around. And so uh, it's again. Remember, each scenario gets its own instance of step definitions. And so what we have here, when it, it's when we have the phrase today is Thursday in this scenario, we specify we we assign the value of Thursday to the variable today. Now you'll notice that given is, is annotated with, with today is Thursday here. Um, and then we also have when and then. Uh, now you'll also notice one thing I failed to mention is that we have uh, additional keywords, but and, and and. And so the interesting thing here is that, believe it or not, given, when, and then are interchangeable along with and and but. What Cucumber does, it just looks for these keywords and then maps them to phrases that we have. Um, and so uh, it doesn't matter which one we use. And you'll notice there's no and, there's no and and but here. And so um, this allows us to be very flexible with our, our step or with our step definitions or uh, that we create. Um, what else? Um, so. Hmm. Uh, hey Jim, can, can I jump in and ask you another question yeah, while you're absolutely. explaining this one? Mm -hmm. uh, later on the list, we have one that says, what is a step definition? I thought, is it appropriate for you to get that question? Yes, so absolutely. That's great. That's can a understand. Great question. Yes. So uh, so you'll see here this phrase, given today is Thursday, is is what is a, is a step. And the, the code behind that phrase is the step definition. So fantastic question. Thank you. So um, that that's what a step definition is, and here we have um, the 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 uh, the string uh, that we that we can, that we've defined as the the variable that is passed into uh, into the, the method uh, when we um, when it's injected. You can also have ints, you can have doubles. There's also the capability that you have to define it yourself, but for cucumber to transform a specific uh, phrase or a specific uh, word to a uh, to, to a complex value. Uh, and um, so that's certainly possible as well. Um, and again, that's also detailed in that Cucumber for Java book. Uh, another one we have is, can you explain the term test harness? Uh, yes, test harness. So. Uh, in this case, uh, we're using JUnit 4 uh, as our test harness, and it will actually perform the fail. It'll actually fail our our uh, our test for us. So if I were to take, and you can see here that this is org.junit assert. This is JUnit 4, and if I were to say assert assert not equals, uh, then it will take. And if I rerun all of our unit tests, it will um, uh, for both of these all of our unit tests should actually fail. Um, so I'll go ahead and rerun it and we should see these fail. So you can see here we have some failures. So I should be told nope, that was not the case. Um, and same thing here. 
and here and here as well. You can see we have failure. So, um, uh, and also actually if I were to take and rerun this as the cucumber test, we can we can see what fails and what passes. So if I were to take and back, uh, say back this one out, we can see that the ice cream test will fail, but the Friday tests will pass. Let me run that, actually. Let me do it this way. Right here. And then we'll run the cucumber report itself. Uh oh, okay, so the test failures. So um, let's go ahead and rerun this and see what happens. So if I refresh it, show us what failed. Very good. So now we can drill in and see what exactly failed. Uh, and okay. And um, it says on Friday. So you can see what exactly it was that failed. So we can see the actual we can see the return value. Um, so there you have it. So, uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, but again, you can use uh, JUnit 4, JUnit 5, or TestNG um, the two to, as your test harness. So this again, the test harness will tell us, uh, will, will provide the capability to actually fail the, these tests for us. All right, Jim, the next one we have is, can we use page object models with BDD? Uh, I believe that is correct. Yes, that, that's detailed in the Cucumber for Java book. I specifically remember seeing seeing that those are used uh, as part of the um, uh, uh, in the, the Selenium web driver test chapter. Uh, the next question we have, what software do you need to run a Cucumber web test cases? Uh, I, you know, I haven't run Cucumber web test cases myself. Um, uh, though, uh, yeah, I, I wish I could answer your question. I'm sorry, I can't. I'm... All right. Uh, should any code be written within the test runner class? Uh, you really don't need it, no. Um, uh, if you're referring to the run Cucumber test class, no, it's not necessary, necessary at all. Um, Cucumber will, uh, will know what to do. Um, you just specify the Cucumber options and the run with, or in fact, if, he, uh, it, uh, it, if I recall, it actually took and uh, it, would, it would tell us the, um, uh, the classes that were required as well. Um, uh, so in the sub definitions, it'll tell you what annotations are needed. Earlier this morning, I tried with, uh, with uh, Cucumber 6 and it told me the annotations I needed to add here uh, as part of the step definitions class. Jim, do you want the good news or the bad news? Let's have the bad news first. The bad news is I only have one question left to you, for you. Okay. But the, but the good news is I think you've absolutely smashed the, the count of questions that we've had. They, they oh, poured fantastic. in for quite a while. I Let hope me get that's to a good this thing. Last question. Oh, that's a great thing. Let me get to the last good, question. Good. What is the maximum number of steps that are to be written within a scenario? As many as you want. But I strongly, strongly urge you uh, to, to keep it readable. To keep it understandable, to keep it legible for anyone who sits down and reads your feature. Uh, this is critical because we're reading, we're, we're creating the scenarios, the features for other people to read. Think of it as, as a living document that, that if somebody brand new to the team were to sit down and read this as, as, a, uh, as a document, they could quickly understand what's going on. So if it really needs it, if you have to, make it big. But again, try to keep it five, maybe seven steps at the most. Um, but it, bigger than that, you, know, you get to the, the, plus, uh, the, the is it five plus or minus two or seven plus or minus two. One of those, uh, it starts to get hard to keep things in our head. And you want to have this easy to read, easy to understand so that anybody, again, anybody could open up the code base and, and look at it and, and quickly understand what is going on and what the the cases for that feature that that you're trying to capture uh, in the in that scenario. Oh, and one of the things that I forgot to mention is that you can also in your feature files instead of using given when thens you can also use bullet points or dashes, which is pretty interesting. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so you have to use uh, asterisks. So that can be really helpful. So if you have 
um, if you have multiple things that are given, for example, um, you can specify uh, stars instead, which is quite nice if, you, if that's going to make your, uh, your steps a, a bit easier to read if you feel like it. All right, so that's the bad question. What's the good, uh, that's the bad news. What's the good news? Oh, maybe you didn't hear me earlier. I mentioned I think you completely destroyed the record we've ever had for most questions. <laughs> OK, doing, wonderful. Uh, that's a lunch and learn, so great job. Thank, with you. That. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, and then quick, quick recap, if you're curious, um, the, uh, uh, the supported languages um, are, are here. Um, we have, uh, again, the ones that are supported are Java, JavaScript, Ruby, and uh, OCaml, C++, uh, Lua, and, uh, Android, Colin, uh, Tickle, and then Go. Um, so that's where, if, 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 uh, if you're using those, you're in great shape. Others, you might find a little bit hit or miss, um, but uh, certainly get involved, start using it. It's, it's a lot of fun. It can make uh, programming much more uh, collaborative, much more enjoyable. And, and it brings the, the user to the center of uh, our development efforts because without our users, without our customers who are typically in a lot of pain, uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be able to have this amazing opportunity that we have to enjoy what we do. Uh, so again, I strongly encourage you to, to keep the user in mind as you write your unit tests. Or not, I'm sorry, not unit tests, but your cucumber, cucumber scenarios and to empathize with you, to have compassion for them, to really understand, put yourself in their, in their shoes so you can see with their eyes what they need, what they really want. Again, okay. thank you so, is that it, is that it, Shriven? If you're done, Jim, that's it. Let me, okay, uh, thank you. you and again, start. thank you so much. My name is Jim Bethencourt. Uh, I'm happy to be here today presenting to you. I work for Improving. And um, I, it's, it's been a great having you as an audience. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you all for attending today's virtual Lunch and Learn. And Jim, thank you for sharing Getting Started with Cucumber. The recording of this session will be available the next business day. To view the recording, locate the session from Improving's virtual events page. And while you're at the virtual events page, be sure to register for future Lunch and Learn sessions. This Friday, Devlin Miles will be presenting We May Be Looking at This Wrong. And next Friday, Kelly Tableau will be presenting Usability and Empathy, Writing ADA Compliant Code. All right.